assistance, I want to welcome you back to the second DVD in our series, Decision Time. You have viewed the first DVD in this series, How Soon is Soon? And now we are going to proceed on with DVD number two. This whole series will consist of probably five or six um, albums. We're going to challenge you as we get into the Word of God. Your mind will be through the challenge. We want to turn in our Bibles to 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verses 15, as we get into our study for today. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 15. And I hope you have a King James Bible. If you don't have a King James Bible, you need to get a King James Bible. 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, verses 15. Let us read together before we have our prayer. Let us read together. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Right from the beginning, brothers and sisters, we see that it is necessary for you and I to study the word of God to show ourselves approved unto God. That word study from, comes from a Greek word, spudazu, and the word means to hurry up, to make haste, and dig deep into the word of God. Brothers and sisters, the time in which we live in requires us to study deep. Matter of fact, we are told that surface readers will be lost. And so, saints, we want to get into the word of God seriously. But before we do this, let us have a word of prayer. Let us invite God's presence to be with us, Father in heaven. In the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, I ask thy blessing, Lord, upon this information that we are going to attempt to share with thy people. The time is very critical. The hour is late. And we need to understand things that we do not at this present time understand. We need to make application, Lord, of your word. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will attend this feeble effort. We pray, Lord, that I will speak to me as well as to those that will be viewing this DVD. Speak to their hearts. We ask, Lord, that I will convince them. Lord, we ask that they will be convicted and be converted. And we pray also, Lord, that they will become a part of this team as well as myself and others that you will use to finish this work. Saints, let us turn in our Bibles to 2 Timothy, 2 Peter, rather, 2 Peter, chapter 1, and let's look at verses 19. This is a very familiar text, a very familiar text. We have read it many times in the past. You have read it many times, and we want to read it again. The Bible says in 2 Peter, verses chapter 19, chapter 1, verses 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Here the Bible is telling us that prophecy is as a light that shines in a dark place. So the Bible is saying that metaphorically speaking, prophecy does the same thing for us that a light does for us as we walk in the night or as we drive at night. We need our lights to help us to see. So prophecy lets us see into the dark. Let's us see that which we normally cannot see in, in and of ourselves. So we know, brothers and sisters, that the future is darkness to us. We cannot know the future in and of ourselves. Prophecy is a light that shines into the future to allow us to see what's going to take place before it actually takes place. God in his mercy has made it possible for you and I as Seventh-day Adventists to understand these precious truths. As a matter of fact, Testimonies, Volume 5, page 708. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 708. The prophet tells us, whatever may be man's intellectual advancement, let him not for a moment think that there is no need of thorough and continuous searchings of the scriptures for greater light. As a people... As a people, we are called individually to be students of prophecy. Brothers and sisters, the prophet goes on to say 
that ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists. And with this, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And so, brothers and sisters, we have been given a mandate to present prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists. And with this, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And what are we talking about when we're talking about behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world? We are talking about righteousness by faith. In this series, saints, we are going to get into some prophetic study. Some old prophetic study and some new prophetic study. We're going to go to the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. These are the two most profound prophetic books in the word of God. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Looking at our screen, you will see that we're going to deal with the prophetic king of the south at the time of the end. The prophetic king of the south at the time of the end. Brothers and sisters, this is a subject that's going to require you to be real serious, you need to get your pen, you need to get your paper. You need to forget about other things, you need to sit down, you need to pray, and you need to ask God for directions as we dwell into this day. There are some things, saints, that's going to be revealed to you that are a little bit out of the ordinary because we as a people have studied the prophecies down to 1798, but we have not gone past 1798. For some reason or the other, we come down to 1798 and we talk about the papacy or the, the fifth head, and then we stop right there. And that's way back. That's 1798. That's what almost, uh, but to almost 200 years ago. And uh, we don't go any further, but we are going to go a, a step further in this study. Actually, saints, we're going to come all the way down to 2008. Another statement from the pen of inspiration, from the book Education. Look at what it says, saints. The history which the great I am has marked out in his word, uniting link after link in the prophetic chain, from eternity in the past to eternity in the future, tells us where we are today in the procession of the ages and what may be expected in the time to come. Did you get that, brothers and sisters? As we study history, history is simply fulfilled prophecy. So it says here, the history which the great I am has marked out in his word, uniting link after link in the prophetic chain from eternity in the past to eternity in the future tells us where we are today in the possession of the ages and what may be expected in the time to come. So as we study prophecy, brothers and sisters, it will take us from the past to the present to what's going to take place in the future. So let us get into our prophetic study now. And you know, in any prophetic study, we must lay a good foundation. I have a friend that is a retired carpenter was a carpenter for many years, and I learned from him and from my own experience that one of the greatest things in carpentry is to lay a good foundation. If you don't start with a good foundation, then when you, by the time you get the building finished, you're going to be way off. And so, brothers and sisters, for, inf for the information we're going to share with you, we need to lay a good foundation. Let's look at our screen right quick. The Bible says, Spirit of Prophecy says, brother, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. They will be given such glimpses of the open gates of heaven that heart and mind will be impressed with the character that all must develop in order to realize the blessedness which is to be the reward of the pure in heart. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days, especially the man of attention. The last book of the New Testament scripture is full of truth that we need to understand. Satan will have the minds of many so that they have been glad of any excuse for not making the revelation their study. Christ, through his servant John, has here declared what shall be in the last days, and he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. 
a message that will arouse the churches is to be proclaimed. Every effort is to be made to give the light, not only to our people, but to the world as well. Now, with that in mind, let us go to a familiar, very familiar chapter in Daniel 2. And let's begin now to lay this foundation for our study. Remember, what we want to do is lay a foundation that will validate what we're going to learn in, in Daniel, the 11th chapter. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has gone down to Egypt and he has defeated Necho, king of Egypt. At this point in time, Jerusalem was, was subject to the Egyptian king and a power in the north begins to rise up and Nebuchadnezzar goes down and defeats Necho and he takes the wisest men in Egypt captive and bring them with him in his entourage as he now leaves and comes up through Jerusalem. And he comes and he stops at Jerusalem and he just simply tells the king there that you will no longer pay any tribute money to Necho because he has been now defeated by me. And he looks among the Hebrew children and he picks the wisest children. And there's a long story behind why they were so smart, etc., etc. But he picks the wisest men there and he tells them now that you will send tribute money now down to Babylon. And he allowed Jerusalem to remain as a nation. So Jerusalem was not taken captive at this time. That's, that happened a few, a few years later. But he now brings these uh, children uh, down to Babylon. And after bringing them down there, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar now has a dream. And as he has a dream, he forgets, he, he, he can't remember what he's dreamed. And he calls for all of his wise men to interpret this dream for him. Of course, they cannot interpret it. And he's angry, and he, and he wants to kill all the wise men of Babylon. And then, this is when Daniel comes into play. He comes to uh, the lieutenant of, of, of Nebuchadnezzar, and he asks him what, what's, what's to rush, etc. And he asks him, he pleads for Arach to let him go and pray to his God, that God may reveal to him what Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We all heard the story many times. I'm just giving you a little tidbits of it. Daniel and his fellows goes and pray. God reveals to Daniel the dream, and he gives the interpretation. We're going to pick up now, as Daniel now comes back before Nebuchadnezzar, to tell Nebuchadnezzar the dream as well as the interpretation. Now listen, brothers and sisters, as we go to the word of God. In chapter 2, verses 37, the Bible says, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven have given thee a kingdom, power, and and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and have made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. This is Nebuchadnezzar. He says this head of gold, this dream which you've had, this head of gold represents the kingdom of Babylon. He says Nebuchadnezzar, that head of gold represents your kingdom. And you notice on the screen at this point in time, that we have a date attached to it. That's 605 to 538. When we're studying prophecy, we need to be able to understand the dates. We need to get the dates right. I remember when I was in school, I hated history. And one of the things about history is that you had to remember the dates. You had to put the date attached to everything. When we're studying prophecy, brothers, we need to know the dates. And it's, it's going to become very critical because each pro as each prophecy is fulfilled, we need to know at what point in time in history was it fulfilled as we walk forth in time. As we continue to walk forth in time, it's going to bring us down to our present. What we're going to do through this study is bring us all the way down to 2008. Now, that would be a few DVDs down the road. But we're going to walk through systematically, and I promise you, saints, this is something that we very definitely need to understand and comprehend. Again, I want to encourage you to have you get your pencil, get your pad, take notes. When you need to pause this DVD, please do so. Understand what we're talking about. You don't want to just view and listen. You want to study. Let's continue. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom and power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hands, and have made thee rule over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Verse 39 says, 
And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. And then verse 4 it says, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. I want us to key in on verse 40 because it is an identifying verse. And here's what it says, And the fourth kingdom. So what the Bible is saying here, saints, is that from the time that Nebuchadnezzar is ruling, from 605 to 538, four kingdoms down the road would be this dreadful power. It says, let me read it again, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, as to do with all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. This fourth kingdom is going to help us to identify later on in, in chapter 7. I'll let you know that we're going to be looking at parallels, parallels, parallels. So, continuing on, let's, let's look what that screen says now. So it says, there shall be another kingdom after Babylon. That was Medo Persia who ruled from 539 to 331. And then there would be a third kingdom, which was Greece, who ruled from 331 to 168. And then this fourth kingdom, which was Rome, who ruled the world from 168 BC to 476 AD. Four kingdoms. So in Daniel 2, God lays out for us a foundation of four kingdoms. Now we're going to build on this foundation as we continue. And then it, then it continues in verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of part is clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with mire of clay. So it says the feet represents the divided kingdom, brothers and sisters. Now we're going to move straight from Daniel 2 now over to Daniel 7, because we're not... The purpose of this DVD is not to get into all the nuts and bolts of these visions. What we want to do is just lay the foundation of the nations that God has given us. This is going to be a very important point that we need to bring up. Now, let's turn over to Daniel, the seventh chapter. Daniel 7, we are studying the word of God, saints. We are laying a foundation that will help us understand future prophecies that we are going to study on down the road here. Daniel, the seventh chapter. In the first year of Belteshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. In Daniel 2, it was Nebuchadnezzar that had a dream. In Daniel 7, it's Daniel himself that's having a dream. Now watch the dream that Daniel has. Look what it says. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse, one from another, meaning they were different. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So he says the first was like a lion. Now I want to go to verse 23. Verse 23 says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Now let's compare verses 23 of Daniel chapter 7 with verses 40 of Daniel chapter 2. Let's compare now. This is just so we make sure that we understand what we're studying here. In Daniel 2 it says, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. That's verse 40 of chapter 2. Chapter, verse 23 of chapter 7 says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's dream is the same dream from a different perspective, different, different uh, 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 images representing the, the various kingdoms, etc. But it is the same vision with more information being given. So let's continue. Daniel says the first was like unto a lion. 
So in Daniel's vision, in Daniel's dream, the lion represents Babylon. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the head of gold represents Babylon. Continue on. The second beast, which was a bear, represents Medo-Persia. Now, we're not going to get into the, 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 the details here of the three, the three ribs and all that because that's not our purpose, what we're, what we're doing here in this particular video. So Medo-Persia is represented by the bear, 539 to 331. And remember these animals now. The third is the leopard-like beast, which, is represented, which represents Greece from 331 to 168. And then the fourth is this nondescript beast, which, we will, which looks as a dragon. That's the reason that we put it in here as a dragon, that the commentators normally use a dragon to, to, to describe this fourth beast. So Rome is represented here, and it ruled the world from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. Now, brothers and sisters, let's make sure we are understanding what we are seeing because, see, the Bible interprets its own self. What happens, saints, so often is that we become up with our own interpretation. We need to let the Bible interpret itself. We'll come up with fanciful theories if we don't stick with the foundation. Let's understand the foundation because I promise you this is going to become so very important later on as we continue in our study. So here we see. That we have now a bear, we have a lion, we have a bear, we have a leopard with four heads, and we have this nondescript beast, which is we have likened unto a dragon. Again, we have four kings, four kingdoms that's been laid out here. Now, let's add a fifth kingdom. I'm going to continue reading now. I'm going to go to Daniel 7, verses 15, after Daniel has had the vision. Now the interpretation is given. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this, so he told me and made me know the interpretation thereof, interpretation of the things. These great beasts which are four are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I will know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. Now he's being given the interpretation. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. So in Daniel's dream, more information is given. Skipping on down now. Verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. History tells us, brothers and sisters, that the Western Roman Empire was indeed divided up into ten nations. The Germanic tribes came down and invaded the Western Roman Empire, and from 351 to 476, about 125 years, eventually the Western Roman Empire was divided up into ten Ten nations. Now it's not, again, our goal here is not to get into the ten nations, etc., etc. One thing we do want to bring out is that three of those nations were plucked up, just like the Bible said. It said a little horn came up among these ten horns, and three of these horns were plucked up. And we know historically that the Hurli, 493 AD, the Vandals, 534 AD, and the Ostrogoths, 538 AD, were plucked up. They were plucked up at those dates. Now, the Ostrogoths was ran out of Rome in 538, and, and eventually in 553, the last battle, they were destroyed. And you hear no more about the Hurley, Eye, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. So just like the Bible says, a little horn, a power comes up among these ten horns and plucks up three of these horns. Now, the key thing here we want to understand is that the Bible zeroes in on this little horn, not the ten horns. It is the little horn that the Bible zeroes in on. It's the little horn that talks about what it did. Look, let's continue. 
It says in verse 25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, the little one will, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and time in the dividing of time. Now again, it's not our purpose to get into that. The thing we want to establish here is that here is another power that comes on the scene. And we know that this power represents the Catholic Church, the papacy. And we know that this power came on the scene in 538 and it ruled the world th until 1798. So here we see now another power has been added. And now we have five powers. We have Babylon. We have Medo-Persia. We have Greece. We have pagan Rome. And now we have paper Rome of the Catholic Church. Five powers. This is the foundation. Five powers has, been, has now been revealed in Daniel, the seventh chapter. Let's continue, brothers and sisters. Now we're going to go to Daniel, the eighth chapter, and see this thing continue to unfold for us. Let's continue looking here. Here we see our little horn that comes up and plucks up three. And here's the picture now. On our left, we have the image of Daniel 2. On the right, we have the beasts that represents the same power. And we see the time, the timeline down, down between the two of them. Let's move now to Daniel, the eighth chapter. Daniel, the eighth chapter, as we continue to let the Bible unfold to us. Let's look at Daniel, the eighth chapter now. We are studying the word of God. In the third year of the reign of King Belteshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. Daniel's having another vision. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but the one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last, continuing on with this vision, Verse 4, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beasts might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Here we have a ram. The vision is verses 1 through 14. On our right, we have the ram. On our left, we have a he-goat. And on the left, we have the explanation of this vision. This vision runs from verses 1 through verses 14. It starts out with a ram and then a he-goat. In verse 5, it says, As I was considering the hole, and he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now, brothers and sisters, let us understand something here. Let's make sure we understand something here. Daniel 8. From verses 1 through verses 14, Daniel receives the vision. From verses 20 through verses 26, Gabriel comes and gives him the interpretation or the explanation of the dream or vision that he has had. We are going to deal with this to some degree. Now, when we get down to verses 13 and 14, we know this is what's dealing with the 2300-day prophecy, and it's not our purpose here in this in this particular video to deal with the 2300 day prophecy, etc. So we're going to deal with that part of the vision that's going to be applicable to what we're studying here at the time. All right, let's continue with, it, with, with reading the vision. We first we see a, a ram, now we see a he goat, and let's continue. And he came to, to the ram, verse 6, and he came to the ram that had two horns which had been standing before the river and ran unto him in the fear of his power. Verse 7. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved a color against him and smoked the ram and break his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Continue on. Verse 9, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Verse 10, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and other stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Verse 11, 
Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now that word sacrifice is a supplied word, and we won't get into that either. Verse 12. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. In verse 13 and verse 14, we're familiar with what it talks about the cleansing of the sanctuary, etc. And that's another study in itself. Now, when you get over to verse 15, it says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. Verse 16, look at verse 16. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man. Understand, O son of man. For at the time of the end shall be the vision. I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, it's time for us to understand. It's time for us to get back to the book. It's time for us to understand what we're reading. It's time for us to inquire of God. Lord, help me to understand your word. Verse 18. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. Verse 19. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation for at the time appointed, the end shall be. Go on to our screen now. The ram, Gabriel begins to explain. Now he says, the ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Medea and Persia. Brothers and sisters, we don't have to guess about this. Gabriel says that that ram represents the kingdom of Medea and Persia. And someone come on and tell you something different, brothers and sisters. I would have to go along with what the Bible says. Gabriel himself says that ram represents the kingdom of Medea and Persia. Now, in Daniel 2, it was the breast of Sibyl that represented the kingdom of Medea and Persia. In Daniel 7, it was a bear with three ribs in his mouth that represented the kingdom of Medea and Persia. But in Daniel 8, it is a ram that represents the kingdom of Medea and Persia. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let's continue. Let's see what Gabriel says. All right, so the kingdom of Medea and Persia ruled the world from 539 to 331. All right? And Gabriel continues in verse 21, he says, And the rough goat is the king of Grisha, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Again, Gabriel says that that rough goat represents the king of Grisha, and the horn between his eyes represents the first king. So, the rough goat represents Grisha, or Greece, who ruled the world from 331 to 168, and the, and the first king at that time, was none other than Alexander the Great. So, brothers and sisters, again, Gabriel is, is telling us himself what this means. And this just validates Daniel 2. It lets us know now who, those, who, the, who the silver and the brass was. It validates in Daniel 7. It lets us know who exactly the bear was, who the, the leopard-like beast was with the four heads, etc. So, brothers and sisters, we don't even have to guess here. God is laying out a solid foundation for us. Let's continue. Now, he says, where is that, that horn, that, that, that horn was between the, the, the eyes. Let's read it, from, let's read it right, from, right from the word of God. He says, and the rough goat, verse 21, and the rough goat is the king of Grisha, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now, verse 22. Now, that being broken, where his four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. So he says, that that, that horn between the rough goat's eyes was going to be broken, which was Alexander the Great. And historically, we know Alexander conquered the world so fast. That's the reason that leopard-like beast had wings on his back. He conquered the world so fast. He came on the scene in 331. He had conquered the whole world, brothers and sisters, by 323. And he had died, and he died. And when he died, he left his, his kingdom well, 36 journals, 36 journals was, was in place when Alexander, when Alexander got, died. Now, we'll talk about that a little later on also. Normally, when a king died, the kingdom fell to his posterity. But the Bible will say that in this case, with Alexander's kingdom, it would not fall to his posterity. But he says that horn that was between his eyes was going to be broken. And he says when it will be broken, that four will stand up in its place. Let's continue. 
four kingdoms will stand up. It says not, let's see what it says from the scripture. Let's see what it says. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. The Bible says, when Alexander passed off the scene, four kingdoms are going to stand up, but not in his power. In other words, not after Alexander's posterior. As I said earlier, when Alexander died, there were 36 generals in his army. Those 36 were reduced to four and ended up that his kingdom was divided between his four generals. So we see that Daniel 8 now will collaborate with Daniel 7 because in Daniel 7 we have a leopard-like beast that represents Alexander the, uh, the Grecian Empire and this leopard-like beast has four heads. Now let's look at the generals that took over his kingdom. They are Cassander, Lysissimus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And on our left we says, therefore the he goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven, Daniel 8, 8. As Gabriel is explaining it in Daniel 8, 22, he says, now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power, Daniel 8, 22. So saints, here we see. Again, the Bible is explaining itself. Here we see that in Daniel 7, the leopard-like beast represents Alexander's empire, the Grecian empire. The leopard-like beast has four heads. In Daniel 8, we have a rough goat that represents Alexander's empire. The notable horn between the rough goat's eyes represents Alexander. The Bible says that that horn would be broken, the notable horn, which represented Alexander. He died in an untimely death in 323 B.C. And four of his generals ended up ruling his empire, not his brothers or sisters or wife or sons or any of that. For a while they did, but the Bible says they would pass off the scene, and we'll talk a little bit later on just how quickly they did pass off the scene. What we're doing here is establishing that the Bible is its own in interpreter. And if we let the Bible interpret itself in the light of history, we will not go astray. And the reason I'm emphasizing this so much, because as we continue with this study throughout the other rest of the DVDs, we're going to run into some situations where we're going to, there's all kinds of stuff out here to direct us the wrong way. And it's simply because they have not laid a good foundation. We want to lay a good foundation and we will see exactly what God is trying to teach us. Saints, and I promise you, it's serious. It is very serious. Let's continue. So Alexander, from 323 to 301 B.C., we see that his empire changed hands. I mean, his, the fighting con went back and forth uh, for, for many years. And finally, in 301 B.C., his empire was now divided between Cassander, Lysissimus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. Let's continue. The Bible says, now, out of one of them, out of what one of them? Out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Now I'm going to see, brothers and sisters, thus far, are you good Bible students? Let me ask you a question now. And I wish you could speak back through that, the camera to me. Let me ask you a question. In Daniel 2, we have the head of gold that represents Babylon. We have the breast that represents Medo-Persia. We have the belly and, and thighs that represents Greece. And we have the legs that represents Rome. And then we have the feet part of iron part of clay. It represents the divided kingdom. In Daniel 7, we have a lion that represents Babylon. We have a bear with three ribs in his mouth that represents Medo-Persia. We have a leopard with four heads that represents the Greece, Grecian Empire. And we have this nondescript beast that we have likened unto a dragon that represents pagan Rome. And then we have a little horn that comes up. Uh, among the ten kings that represents paper Rome. Now, uh, the question to you is, in Daniel 8, it does not start with Babylon because at this time, Babylon has passed off the scene and it starts with Medo-Persia. So it starts off with a, a ram that represents Medo-Persia. It starts, then, then comes the rough goat, which represents Alexander the Great. And then a little horn comes up. Now, if I follow the pattern the template 
the foundation of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, who would the little horn represent? That's the question. I wish I could ask that question to you and get a, a feedback. Because if you don't know, that means you have not yet been understanding what we have been studying. Now, who would that little horn represent? Let's see who would that little horn represent. Let's go back to our screen. Out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. So here we see the little horn that comes out and he waxes exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Continue. When the Bible says out of one of them, what it's actually saying is from one of the four points of the compass would come another power. Who is this next power that will come on the scene? If you've answered pagan Rome, then you are correct because pagan Rome would have to be the next power that comes on the scene. This is critical that we allow the Bible to explain itself, brothers and sisters. And the way we can know is from the template that has already been given to us from Daniel 2, Daniel 7, we are now in Daniel 8. So this little horn comes out first as pagan Rome. It comes out as pagan Rome. Now who comes after pagan Rome? Who comes after pagan Rome? And if you answered paper Rome, then again you would be correct. Because paper Rome has to come out next. Because Daniel 2, Daniel, rather Daniel 7 tells us this. Now, so in Daniel 8, God combines pagan Rome with paper Rome because it is pagan Rome that gave to paper Rome his power, its seat, and great authority. And I want you to know that it's so very critical in our study to recognize that it was pagan Rome that gave to paper Rome its power, its seat, and great authority. And we'll talk about that later when we get on down the road. So, the Bible continues, says, and it waxed great, talking about this little horn, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Now, education. It's time for education here. Let's look back at what we read. At the top, we says, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, well, I might point this way for the south, and toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. What we see here is a horn that's operating over the face of the earth. It's conquering over the face of the earth. But look as, this, as it continues. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. At first it's going horizontal. It's going horizontal. But then it goes vertical. Pagan Rome conquered horizontal. But paper Rome had the audacity to go vertical, to try to place itself in the place of God himself. Look what it says. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Let's go back to our Bibles again. Back to our Bibles in, in chapter 8. Look what it says in verse 10. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Verse 11. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Here the Bible says that this little horn in his final phase, cast a sanctuary to the ground. Now, we know that the papers could not literally cast a sanctuary to the ground, but in other words, it's Jesus that dwells in the sanctuary above, and so, and that's where Jesus was the mediator, but the papers had cast the mediation of Jesus to the ground and took up the mediation of Jesus himself, where you would have to go to a priest to get forgiveness of sin rather than going to Jesus himself. The Bible says he cast the sanctuary to the ground. Look what else it says. It says, yea, he cast his sanctuary to the ground. Yea, he magnified, magnified himself even to the prince of hosts, and by him the daily was, was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast to the down, ground. And verse 12 says, and an host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. The Bible says, not only did it cast the sanctuary to the ground, it cast the truth to the ground. Well, where is the truth? The truth is in the sanctuary. So by casting the sanctuary to the ground, it cast the truth to the ground, and then it was able 
to practice and prosper. Do you understand this, brothers and sisters? Let's continue. I hope you're getting this. If you need to stop this tape and, and back it up and pause it and study it again and search it out, do so, brothers and sisters. You need to understand what we're seeing here. Let's continue. So, so it comes up first as pagan Rome and then it changes to paper Rome. Let's continue, saints. And as Daniel, I mean, as Gabriel continues to explain this, this text, this, this, this vision to Daniel, verse 23, Daniel 8, 23, saints, I hope you're understanding this. This is going to come back later down the road. We're laying a foundation. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sense, you'll stand up. This is Gabriel explaining what we just talked about. This is the papacy. I mean, paper, this is the pagan Rome here. Verse 24 is the papacy. And his power shall be mighty, not by his own power. Now, remember, the low horn starts out as pagan Rome. Pagan Rome ruled the world from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. Paper Rome continued when Constantine left uh, the western part of the Roman Empire he gave his power, seat, and great authority to the bishop of Rome, who eventually became pope. And so the papal Rome ruled the world from 538 A.D. until 1798 A.D. Now look what the, what the text says, Daniel 8, 24. And his power shall be mighty. Whose power is going to be mighty? The papal power, the Catholic Church, their power is going to be mighty. And his power shall be mighty, but look what it says but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. The Bible says the papacy of the Catholic Church would, have, would be mighty. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Now I want you to think on that for a moment. How did the Catholic Church derive their power? Where did they get their power from? The Bible says it and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. As we get on into this, we're going to explain it. But I want you to think on it. You might need to pause, pray. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Let's continue. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken with that hand all through the Bible. As the Bible talks about this power, but it always talks about him eventually being broken with that hand. And that means no earthly power is going to break him. The God of heaven is going to have to break his power. The God of heaven is going to take away his dominion. All through the Bible, we see this, brothers and sisters, when it, thinks, when it talks about this haughty power. God himself is going to break his power. There's so many things I want to add in here right now, but I have to wait as we get on into this. Saints, let's get this, let's get this down. Okay, brothers and sisters, we want to continue on now. We have laid a foundation, so let's, let's look at the screen now and see what we have talked about thus far. We start with Daniel 2, with the image. We move to Daniel 7, which we have the beasts, or the lion, the 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 bear, the leopard, and the nondescript beast. And we moved on to Daniel, the eighth chapter, where we are now. And we looked at the ram and the he-goat, and then the little horn that comes up, which represented uh, pagan Rome and then paper Rome. And now we're going to move to, Revel to Daniel, the eleventh chapter. Now, as we move to uh, Daniel, the eleventh chapter, it is a continuation of what we've already studied in Daniel 2. Daniel 7, and Daniel 8. But before we move to Daniel 11, let's look at a few other points. If we go back now <clears throat> to Daniel the 8th chapter, now I stopped reading at verses, chapter 8, verses 12. Let's continue reading verses 13 and 14. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary
and the host to be trodden on foot, how long shall it be? The answer came, and he said unto me, unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, as I said earlier, it is not the purpose of this particular uh, DVD to deal with the 2300-day prophecy, etc. But for clarification, I want to bring this in at this point in time. As Gabriel began to explain this vision, starting in verses 20, he started with the ram, then he moved on to the he-goat, then he moved on to the breaking of the first horn, then he moved on to the four horns coming up, and he moved on to the, the pagan Roman and paper Roman. But before he could explain verses 13 and 14 of the vision, Daniel thinks, let's read it. As we continue reading here, verse 25, it says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken with that hand. Verse 26. This is Gabriel explaining the vision now to Daniel. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And verse 20 says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Gabriel did not finish interpreting the vision to Daniel. And so when we move into chapter 9 of, of, of Daniel, we see uh, Daniel praying for understanding. And so we move through chapter 9. It says, let's, let's read just a little of it. In the first year there arise the son of Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, that, we, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. I just have to pull up here just for a moment. Because Daniel understood by books that it was time for his people to be delivered from captivity. Now, the books he was reading, of course, was Jeremiah. And so if Daniel could read Jeremiah and understand, look, we're supposed to be down here for 70 years and, and, and could calculate and understand it's about time for us to come out. Brothers and sisters, can you and I not understand the same way from reading God's word? Ellen G. White says we have a chart pointing out every way mark on the heavenward journey and we ought not to guess at anything. As Daniel continues here, it says, verse 3, and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And so you, we are all familiar with this prayer of Daniel as he prayed. Now as Daniel is praying, in verse 20 the Bible says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Now, where did Gabriel come to Daniel in the first time? The first time he came is over in, in um, chapter 8, verse 16. So in chapter 8, verse 16, Gabriel comes to Daniel to explain to him the vision that he had just seen. He, did not, he was not able to finish explaining it because Daniel fainted. All right? Now, so when we get over to Daniel 10, 20, 20, Gabriel comes back now and began to give him more information concerning this vision. And actually what he does, he picks up where he left off at before. And then we go all the way through uh, the, uh, the rest of this chapter 9, go through chapter 9, 20, all the way down to chapter 27, which is very important, but we can't go there now. This, this, this gives us the foundation for the 2300 day prophecy, etc., etc. Then we move on into chapter 10. Gabriel leaves again, but now he comes back for this final time. And let's, let's pick it up again. Verse 18, chapter 10, verses 18. Then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. And said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, 
Peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. And he said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou, wherefore I come unto thee. And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. Verse 21, But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth me in these things but Michael your prince. Now here Gabriel said, listen, Daniel, I'm going to explain to you. I'm going to help you to understand what is in the scripture of truth. Now let's go to our screen a minute. Again, we see in Daniel 2, we have, we have the image. Daniel 7, we have the beast. Daniel 8, we have the, 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 uh, the ram and the he-goat. And now we go to Daniel 11. So in Daniel 11, Gabe was going to pick up and rehash, if I can use that word, uh, reiterate all that he's told Daniel up to this time and give him more detail. Now, if this be true, if he's going to re go over all of this information again and bring him down to where he is, he would have to deal with all these powers that we've dealt with already. Now, so Gabriel picks up with the rise to meet in this, in, as, as he began to explain, because now Babylon has gone off the scene, and so he picks up with the rise to meet. And he begins to go through Daniel 11th chapter, reiterating all this information, giving real detail as to what's going on. If we look at our chart here, uh, Daniel 11, 1, 2 is dealing with the Medo-Persian Empire. From Daniel 11 through 15, we're dealing with the Grecian Empire. From Daniel 11, 16 through 30, we're dealing with pagan Roman Empire. And Daniel 11, 31 through Daniel 11, 40, we are dealing with the paper Rome of the Catholic Church. That's the way Daniel 11 chapter is broken up down to Daniel 11, 40. Now, saints, I want to assure you that we're getting in some deep water here. We're going to have to be intense. We're going to have to be serious. We're going to have to be prayerful. And we're going to have to be attentive. Now, I won't even attempt to go through in detail Daniel 11 on camera here. It would be too much. It would take too long. I have put together a booklet called The King of the North and King of the South that you can purchase. Uh, we will put that information on the screen uh, later on, uh, which will go through. It goes through Daniel 11 verse by verse by verse with detailed information as to each verse. And it moves on, deals with Daniel, I mean, uh, Revelation 17 chapter and Revelation 11 chapter and a few other things that you would need to get or in order to go through this in detail yourself and study it. We're going to just hit some of the high points of Daniel 11 chapter. And we're going to hit these high points just to show you again how accurate the word of God is. But we want to hurry to Daniel 11 chapter verses 40. Now, if we look at Daniel 11, 21, and the Bible says, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. The prophet says, read the book of Daniel. Call up point by point the history of the kingdoms they are represented. Behold, statesmen, councils, powerful armies, and see how God wrought to abase the pride of men and lay human glory in the dust. The light that Daniel received from God was given especially for these last days. The visions he saw by the banks of the Uli and the Hittikel, the great rivers of Shana, are now in process of fulfillment, and all the events foretold will soon come to pass. Brothers and sisters, this, the prophet here is telling us that these things that were written are actually written for you and I, for whom the ends of the world is, come, is going to come, come upon. Continuing on, she tells us, talking about these prophecies, she says the Bible, its great system of truth is not so presented as to be discerned by the hasty or careless reader. Many of its treasures lie far beneath the surface and can be obtained only by diligent research and continuous efforts. The truths that go to make up the great whole must be searched out and gathered up here a little and there a little. When thus searched out and brought together, they will be found to be perfectly fitted to one another. Each gospel is a supplement to the others. Every prophecy and explanation of another. Every truth is a development of some other truth. The types of the Jewish economy are made plain by the gospel. Every principle in the word of God has its place. 
every fact is bearing and the complete structure in design and execution bears testimony to his author such a structure no man but that of the infinite could conceive or fashion now as we look we see the first little circle here on the screen which is red with a yellow key in it representing Daniel the second chapter now look at the next circle because in Daniel 7 <clears throat> we have also a key that opens up Daniel 8 and in Daniel 8 we have a key that opens up Daniel 11 and in Daniel 11 we have a key that opens up Revelation 17 in Revelation 17 we have a key that opens up Revelation the 11th chapter now we're going to go through these we've gone through most of these we're going but we've been about to get intense if I could put it in mathematical equations I would say that Daniel 2 is arithmetic I would say that Daniel 7 is math I would say that Daniel 8 is algebra but brothers and sisters I would call Daniel 11 the most profound mathematics that you can ever study we're going to do, get into some real detailed information real detailed information and you need Daniel 2 you need Daniel 7 and you need Daniel 8 in order to understand Daniel 11 chapter let's continue but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of true and there is none that holds with me in these things but Michael your prince let's look at the commentary on Daniel 10 21 the angel comes back to Daniel this third time to help Daniel understand the vision of Daniel the eighth chapter and what will befall God's people in the latter days so here we see Gabriel is now coming back for the third time to help Daniel understand let's go to our Bible for a moment just a moment looking at our Bible as Gabriel goes through Daniel the 11th chapter all the way through Daniel 11 45 on into Daniel 12 12 we get over to Daniel 12 verses 4 Gabriel finally tells Daniel but thou O Daniel shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end shall many run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased so as Gabriel begins to explain this he tells him look this Daniel shut it up it's not actually written for you it's written for you and I that are now living down here at the end of time so Daniel 20 10 21 again the angel comes back to Daniel this third time to help Daniel understand the vision of Daniel the eighth chapter and what will befall God's people in the latter days let's look at the next verse the next verse says also in the first year of the rise to me even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him and now I will show thee the truth behold there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia and the fourth shall be richer than they all and by his strength through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. and again saints we're not going to go verse by verse through Daniel 11 chapter we're just going to hit a few high points and just see what we can pull out here to collaborate with Daniel 2 Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 let's go the king of Babylon the kingdom of Babylon has fallen the rise to meet is the king of the Medo-Persian Empire the next three kings are Camus 529 BC to 522 BC Smyrtus the imposter 522 BC the one is Tapsus 522 BC to 486 BC then the Bible says the fourth shall be richer than they all which was Xerxes 486 BC to 464 BC known in Esther as a Hazarus and then verse 3 the angel skips past the rest of the Persian king that is from 464 BC down to 331 BC when the mighty king of Grisha comes on the scene which was Alexander the Great let's read verse 3 from our Bibles and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will this mighty king as we've just said is none other than Alexander the Great let's move now to verses 4 and 5 and when he shall stand up his kingdom shall be broken do you see how this Daniel 11 is just collaborating what we've already read over in Daniel 8 and when, when he shall stand up his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven remember Daniel 7 had a, the four-headed beast that represented the Grecian Empire Daniel 8 has a, the the ram which the little horn was broken I mean the horn the notable horn was broken and then four horns came up and now we see in Daniel 11 it says and when he shall stand up his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven 
and not to his posterity. Remember earlier, it says the same thing over in, in, in chapter 8. Nor according to his dominion which he ruled. In other words, his kingdom is going to be divided, but it's not going to fall to his posterity. Okay? For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. Verse 5, And the king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Let's look at our commentary. Alexander was the first king of the Grecian Empire. Now, you will find all this in the, little, in the little book I put together there. Alexander was the first king of the Grecian Empire. The four winds represent the four germs that would divide his empire. They are Cassander, Lysimus, Seleucus, who became king of the north up in Syria, and Ptolemy, who was the king of the south down in Egypt. That's very important, saints. Please get this. This final division of Alexander's empire took place in 301 B.C., after the battle of Ipus, it should be noted that prophecy specifically stated that Alexander's empire shall not be left to his posterity. That is, his empire shall not pass into the rulership of his descendant family, such as his sons, brothers, mothers, etc. And true to the word of God, all of his descendant family that could claim heirship to the throne were murdered as follows. Continue. His wife, Satera, was murdered soon after his death by his other wife, Roxana. His brother, Aridius, who succeeded him, was killed together with his wife, Eurydice, by command of Olympus, Alexander's mother, after he had been king for about six years and some months. Olympias herself was killed by the soldiers in revenge. Alexander Agus, his son, together with his mother, Roxana, was slain by order of Cassander. Two years after his son Hercules with his mother Barsine was probably murdered, probably murdered by Polish Sean, so that 15 years after his death, not one of his family or posterity remained alive. True to the word of God, God said he would not fall to his descendant family. Continue on, saints. After years of fighting between the generals, that is from 301 B.C. to 280 B.C., the four is reduced to two. Lysimus defeats Cassandra and Seleucus defeats Lysimus and becomes the king of the north with a great dominion, having acquired all the territory of Cassandra and Lysimus. Ptolemy retains the territory of Egypt and its providences and is labeled by the angel as the king of the south. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to slow down and make sure that we understand what, we just, what we're reading here. Alexander's empire moved from his death, through his generals, the four generals are finally reduced to two. And the, the angel of prophecy, Gabriel, calls one of these generals, the territory which he possessed, the king of the north. The other generals in his territory was called the king of the south. This is so very important. The king of the north and the king of the south as labeled by the angel of prophecy. Moving on now to verse 6. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but he shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. Now, brothers and sisters, without history, these verses would be just told crazy. But history digs in here and show us what's actually going on. Let's go back to our screen now. First of all, Let's now look at the map to show this territory. Here's a map. Up, in the, up at the top, we have the territory of the king of the north. This is Syria, or the Seleucid kingdom. This is the king of the north. This is what Gabriel labeled as the king of the north. Down at the bottom, we have the king of the south, which is where Egypt was. This is, this, this is the Ptolemies. You got Seleucus up at the top, king of the north. Down at the bottom, we have the uh, Ptolematic kingdom or Egypt, which is called the king of the south. Very important, brothers and sisters. The king of the north is up in Syria. The Seleucids, the king of the south is down in Egypt. Very, very important as we continue to go because saints, the king of the north and the king of the south is still active. Now, in between these two kingdoms was the city or the land of Jerusalem known as Palestine, and the Bible calls this land the glorious land. Very, again, very important. So therefore, 
Jerusalem, the place of God's people, the dwelling place of God's people, his chosen people, was, was between the king of the north geographically and the king of the south geographically. That is very important, extremely important. Now, we know historically, prophetically, that Jerusalem, the, which was called the glorious land, was God's chosen people, but they forfeited that distinct uh, name and position in 34 AD when they rejected Christ and, his, and, and, and all he came to do for them. So their probation closed in 34 AD. So let's put that on the, on, on the screen. In 34 AD, Jerusalem then would cease to be the glorious land because the Jews ceased to be God's chosen people in 34 AD and they could no longer be designated as the, as the glorious land. And so as we continue to study, we're going to see that God's chosen people then had to became someone else. As we, now this is very important that we understand this because as we go through Daniel 11, we're going to see that the, 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 the ruler of the king of the north changing consistently down, down through uh, Daniel 11 chapter. It's going to move from the Seleucids on down. And then eventually we're going to see the king of the south change as well. And we're going to understand that the glorious land was represented by the Jews, which they forfeited that distinct name in 34 AD. We're going to see that change as well. And it's very key that you and I understand what's taking place in order to follow this line of prophecy all the way down to where we are now in 2008. Let's go back now and read again. Well, I already read verses 6. We read it. Uh, let's put one more thing on the screen. One more thing on the screen. This is a commentary from the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Bible commentary. It says, Israel should have been a light to all the world. But because of stubborn rebellion, Jerusalem and Israel was now a byword and a reproach among the nations of the earth. During the time of the rule of the king of the north and the king of the south, Israel, which was caught between these two powers, should have been the, the, the dominant world power. It, all, all roads should have been coming <coughs> to, to, to Jerusalem. They should have been a light among the nations at the time. But because of their disobedience, they were spiritually weak. And as, as, as a result of their spiritual weakness, they were also military weak. And as this commentary says, they were just a byword in the nations at that time. They were, when, when the king of the north defeated the king of the south, then Israel had to pay tribute to the king of the north. When the king of the south defeated the king of the north, then Israel had to pay tribute to the king of the south. And it went back and forth, back and forth. They were just a byword. There was no, no one paid them any attention. They were nothing because they were spiritually weak. They were also militarily weak. Now, let's continue. <clears throat> Here we see <clears throat> a chart depicting the changes as it, as it takes place. <clears throat> Excuse me. From 280 B.C., we have the king of the north being set up uh, and the king of the south being set up. Now, if you look at the top, you see the king of the north moves from Syria of the Seleucids to pagan Rome. And this final transition took place in 64 B.C. However, pagan Rome had come into a, to become a dominant world power in 168 B.C. But the, the Seleucids, the king of the north, was really subdued and defeated in 64 B.C., completely wiped out. Pagan Rome rules until 476 A.D., if you look at your chart. From 476 A.D., we got that little little space there, and then paper Rome takes over from 538 A.D. down to 1798. When we read Daniel 1140, it says, and the king of the south pushed at the king of the north. The king of the north in Daniel 1140 is the papacy, as we will get there a little, a little later. Now, if you look at the bottom of the chart, you will see that Egypt becomes the king of the south, the Seleucids, I mean the Ptolemies in 280 B.C., and they remain so all the way down to 31 B.C., and you hear no more about a king of the south from 31 B.C. until 1798, which is Daniel 1140 also. So for a total of 1,829 years, you'll see that the king of the south is not heard of after its demise in 31 B.C. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now, <clears throat> let's see what we can... Now, we, this is a commentary on verses 7. After years of fighting between the Seleucids in north and Ptolemy south and their respective descendants, a pact was made to bring about peace between the two powers. 
Ptolemy Philadelphus, the second king of the south, gave his daughter in marriage to Antiochus Theosis, the third king of the north. The agreement was that Antiochus, king of the north, was to put away his wife Laodice and her two sons and marry Bernice, the daughter of Ptolemy Philadelphus, king of the south. The marriage was solemnized in the year 249 B.C. in the city of Cilicia, the capital of the uh, Cilician kingdom. However, the scheme to bring peace through marriage did not work. Two years after the marriage, Ptolemy Philadelphia, which was king of the south and father of Bernice, dies. Upon his death, Antiochus Theosis, king of the north, reneges on his marriage to Bernice and removes her from his bed. This act disinherits Bernice and her infant son. Here's the deal. They had to say, said, listen, Ptolemy Philadelphia said, listen, if you will put away your wife, Laodice, and marry my daughter, we can have peace. So he agreed. He put away his wife, Laodice, and their two children, and married the, the daughter of Ptolemy Philadelphia, Bernice, brought her up there. But then after this happens, her father down in Egypt, which is the king of the south, he dies. And when he, when he dies, uh, Antiochus figures, well, I don't have to, I don't have to no longer honor this agreement. So he takes Bernice away. I mean, he, he puts her out and brings back his former wife. And look what happens. Antiochus Theosis recalls his former wife and her two sons. But Laodice, fearing that she could again be removed, decides to secure her position by poisoning her husband. And by an elaborate scheme of deception, secures the throne for her son, Cilicius Callinicius. Neither shall he, Antiochus Theosis, stand nor his arm. Now with Antiochus out of the way, Laodice proceeds to have Bernice, her son, and all her Egyptian attendants killed. The Bible says, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. True to the word of God, just like Daniel 11, 6 says that the kingdom shall not fall to his posterity. Just like it said that the king's daughter shall be given up. Brothers and sisters, the word of God continues all the way through Daniel 11 chapter with accuracy one after another. Let's just skip way down now because my time is, very, is running out quite a bit, getting very close here now. Let's go all the way down now to chapter 12, verses 1, just to let you see how accurate this thing is. From, verses, from what we've read thus far, if we go all the way down to verse, chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. This line of prophecy that is running through chapter 11, starting way back here at the king of the south and the king of the north, continues all the way down to the close of probation. Now, as we go through these verses, and we can't go through them in detail. You have to get to the book to go through them in detail. But as we go through the ones that we're going to see here, you're going to see the accuracy. And if all of these are accurate, saints, moving all the way down through verses 40, 41 on down, then, brothers and sisters, if all the, the, the past history of this, of, this, of this prophecy has been completed and fulfilled, just like God said, that means that which has not yet been fulfilled will be fulfilled in his order, just like we read earlier in Education, page 178. And so, brothers and sisters, it behooves us to let's get serious, let's understand who we are, let's understand what we are about, let's get a connection, a vital connection with Christ now before it is everlasting too late. Let's look at verses 7. Now, I'm going to have to move fast because remember earlier, as we move through here, we're going to move out of the king of the north, king of the south of the Seleucids and move into pagan Rome. Verse 7. Let's look at one more commentary. <clears throat> Verse 7. All right. But out of a branch of her roots, meaning out of a branch of Bernice's root, her brother, Ptolemy Egetus, had just come to the throne in Egypt. Shall one stand up in his estate? But Ptolemy Egetus, the brother of Bernice, stood up in the place of Ptolemy Philadelphia, who had just died. But Ptolemy Egetus gathers a large army and marches with haste into Syria, king of the north. But it is too late to save his sister Bernice because she, her son, and attendants have been murdered by order of Laodice. However, Ptolemy did wage a successful war against Cilicius Callinicius, 
which was the son of Laodai. So just like the Bible says, as we move through this thing, just what the angel Gabriel told Daniel is exactly what has happened in history. Now, let's move down quickly. If we move down to verses 14, because in verses 14, a new power is introduced. Who is this new power that's going to be introduced? If we follow the templates of Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8, we know who the new power is. In Daniel 14, it says, And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. The robbers of thy people here is the introduction of Rome. Rome is now coming upon the scene. She was born to Rome, <clears throat> the history tells us, was uh, came into, into existence down on, the, on the, the Tiber River and began to grow in power a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there until she began to exert herself. So in Daniel 14, the Bible is talking about the robbers of the people, which was pagan Rome, beginning now young but coming on the scene. At this time, uh, there's a young king, uh, Epiphanes, down in uh, Egypt, young Epiphanes. Ptolemy Epiphanes and all the different powers around now are deciding how they can de defeat this man down here and take up cover of his kingdom because they have such a young king down there. And so Epiphanes calls on Rome to help him. But in, the, in, in, in this was around 200 BC, but Rome at this point in time was not strong enough to actually come to their, come to their aid. So they were actually defeated. It, was, it still was 32 years before Rome would become this dominant world power that the Bible speaks of. Moving on down to verses 15, the Bible says, So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mountain and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. If we just go back to our screen a little bit, we'll... Look at a little bit of the commentary here. Far away, the Bible says, I mean, the, the commentary says, on the banks of the Tiber, Rome had been nourishing ambitious projects and dark designs. They were small and weak at first, but it grew in strength and vigor with marvelous rapidity, reaching out cautiously here and there to try its proudness and test its warlike arm, until with consciousness of its power, it boldly reared its head among the nations of the earth and seized with invincible hand the hymns of affairs, Daniel and Revelation, page 243. It was Rome, designated by the angel of prophecy to become the robbers of thy people, that selfishly and with ulterior motives came to the aid of the child king of Egypt. This was 200 B.C. Still, it took 32 years until 168 B.C. when it is agreed by historians that Rome became the dominant world power. Continue on. We are moving on now. Rome did indeed exalt themselves to establish the vision. That is, by sending Joan Scopas with an army of choice troops to defend Egypt. But they shall fall. Antiochus Magnus defeated Scopas and his army and did indeed take the most spent cities of Egypt. Scopas was forced to surrender. But Ptolemy Epiphanes sent forth his best troops to try and aid Scopas. But Antiochus and his army routed them also. True to the prophetic word, the arms of the south Egypt shall not withstand Neither his chosen people, his chosen people meaning Rome, the people that Egypt appealed to for help against the invasion of Antiochus Magnus. Remember, though, this is 200 B.C. There's still 32 years before Rome becomes this dominant power that the Bible said that she would, become, she would come. Looking at verses 16. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. Antiochus invaded Egypt again in 168. He demanded Cyprus and pursued him. He besieged to him. He occupied Lower Egypt and camped outside Alexandria. The cause of the power man seemed lost. But on June 22nd, 168, the Romans defeated Priscilla and his Macedonians at Pada and there deprived Antiochus of the benefits of victory. In Elysius, a suburb of Alexandria, the Roman ambassador, Gaius Papilius Leonis presented Antiochus with the ultimatum that he evacuate Egypt and Cyrus immediately. Antiochus, taken by surprise, asked for time to consider, 
Papilius, however, drew a circle in the earth around the king with his walking stick and demanded an unequivocal answer before Antiochus left the circus. Did you get that, brothers and sisters? This man with his walking stick drew a circle in the sand around the man and said, listen, I want an answer before you leave the circle. And, of course, Antiochus gave him an answer and he left Egypt. This, my brothers and sisters, is where Rome became a dominant world power. Let's continue on from our Bibles now. Verse 17, he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. And he shall give him and give him the daughter of women, corrupting her. But she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. Now, I can't go into all the details. It's just too much details here for us to go into. But let me just say this much. In verse 17, Julius Caesar is introduced. And also Cleopatra number seven is also being introduced here in verses 17. And I, don't even, I didn't even put anything on my, on my screen concerning this. Since the line of Seleucid kings north continue on until 64 B.C., which brings us to verse 16. This verse describes the final invasion and conquest of the territory of the king of the north by the Roman armies under General Pompey. After conquering Syria and making it a Roman province, Pompey proceeded on invading Palestine, designated as the Glorious Land, and finally subdued the Jews in 63 B.C. Note, Palestine was subdued in 63 B.C., but did not become a Roman province until 6 B.C. Now, I know that I'm going a little fast here. You get the book, so you can read this in detail. Because my, my point here is just to show you the accuracy of, of the of the prophecies, but our key thing is to get to Daniel 11, 11 chapter verses 4. Continue on now. The he of verse 16 represented Rome in the personness of Pompey, but in verse 17, 19, the he represents Rome in the personness of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was, became on the scene in 49 BC and he ruled in 44 BC. The angel moves quickly from the Roman Republic, 168 BC, down to 49 BC to the foundation of the Roman Empire, which was laid by Julius Caesar and finally established by Augustus Caesar in 31 to 30 BC. He, Julius Caesar, shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. At this time in history, Egypt is the only country that is not yet, that is, that is yet unoccupied by Rome. A division develops between Jerome Pompey and Julius Caesar which results in a civil war. Pompey is defeated and flees to Egypt. Julius Caesar pursues Pompey to Egypt with the upright ones. Harold Metcalf in his book Insight tells us that the upright ones were 3,000 Jews that assisted Julius Caesar in his pursuit of Pompey into Egypt. These 3,000 Jews were known as Ottomans and were led by Antipater for a brief history of Amina. Ottoman, CSDA Bible Commentary, Volume 8, page 520. And we're moving on, saints. We're moving on. Now let's look at verses 18. And he shall turn his face unto the isles and shall take many, but a prince for his own behalf shall the reproach offered, shall the reproach offered by him to cease without his own reproach. He shall cause it to turn upon him. What is this verse talking about? Let's see. Then he shall turn his face towards the fort of his own land. But he shall stumble and fall and be found. By one account, Julius Caesar had won 50 battles. He had captured 500 cities and killed 1,192,000 men. Yet he would stumble and fall and, and fall because the God of heaven had foretold it. On March the 14th, 44 B.C., Caesar dined with M. Lepidus, who had just been appointed governor of Gaul. The guesses discussed the question as to what kind of death is the most desirable. Caesar declared that the best death was a sudden one. The next morning, his wife begged him not to go to the Senate chamber because of a dream she had the night before. Her entreaties prevailed until Brutus came at the request of his fellow conspirators to persuade him to come because of some urgent matters. As soon as he said had taken his seat on the golden throne beside the statue of Pompey, the conspirators crowded around him as if to ask a favor, and then at a signal ran their daggers into his body. He died of 23 wounds, 
true to the word of God, he shall stumble and fall and not be found. The Bible says, brothers and sisters, that he shall stumble and fall. Even in all of his glory, all of the things that Julius Caesar did, the Bible says he would stumble and fall. Verses 19 now. Then shall he turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Verses 20. Then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. Who came on the scene after Julius Caesar came off, passed off the scene? History tells us that it was a razor of taxes. Who was it? He was Augustus Caesar. He was known as Octavia. And he had a daughter named, uh, I mean not a daughter, he had a, a sister named Octavia. The Bible says, continue, after Augustus came on the scene, and finally it was under Augustus that Egypt was finally subdued when uh, Mark Anthony and uh, Cleopatra entered into a league to try to defeat Rome. Mark Anthony ruled for a time with Augustus there in Rome, but then he was beguiled into going down to Egypt and uh, marrying uh, Cleopatra, and then the two of them conspired to come back to Rome and defeat it, and it's a long story, which I can't go into on camera here, but it came back to Rome, and they were finally defeated, and Egypt is, Egypt, Mark Anthony Cleopatra in Egypt, the king of the south, is defeated in 31 B.C. at the Battle of Actum, and there is no more mention of the king of the south from this part forward until we get down to Daniel 11, chapter, verses 40. So, Egypt, the original geographical king of the south is defeated by Augustus Caesar in September 2nd, 31 B.C. at the Battle of Actum. And you hear no more about them until 1829 years down the road in Daniel 11:40. All of a sudden, this king of the south pops up on the scene. That is key information. Let's look at verses 21. After Augustus Caesar dies in 14 uh, A.D., the Bible says in verse 21, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peacefully and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Brothers and sisters, Tiberius was called the vile one. Augustus had determined that he would not allow him to come to, to the throne, but his wife persuaded him to allow Tiberius to share the throne with him. So in 12 AD, Augustus allowed Tiberius to co-rule with him. And so Tiberius co-ruled with Augustus for two years. Augustus said the man was too vile. I would not have him on the throne with me. But Augustus, but Tiberius pretended to clean up his act so that he could become the, the next emperor. And he did. And so as soon as Augustus passed off the scene, he reverted right back to the same old tactics of what he was doing at first. Now we must move fast, saints. I have to skip over the rest of these verses down to verses 31. In verses 31, the Bible says, a new power again comes on the scene because now we move from pagan Rome to paper Rome. And look what it says, brothers and sisters. As paper Rome comes on the scene, the Bible says, an arm shall stand on his power. Now remember, in Daniel 8, the Bible merges pagan Rome into a smooth transition right into paper Rome. And so that's what it does here in Daniel 11 chapter. It smoothly merges pagan Rome right on into paper Rome. And verses 31 says, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Let's go quickly back to Daniel the 8th chapter and see what does it say in Daniel the 8th chapter Daniel the 8th the Bible says verse 24 and his power shall be mighty but not by his own power remember me emphasizing that early on now in Daniel the 11th chapter verses 31 the Bible says an arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary over in Daniel 8, it says they shall cast the sanctuary to the ground. This is the papacy. Let me read it again. An arm shall stand on its part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. So where is the strength? It is in the sanctuary because that's where Jesus is. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, 
And they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Brothers and sisters, there's so much to share right here. Get the book. So much to share right here, but I must move quickly. So in verses 31, we move now from pagan Rome to paper Rome. And now we stay with paper Rome from verses 31 all the way down to verses 39. Now, are you with me, brothers and sisters? Verses 31 to 39 is dealing with the activities of paper Rome during that 1260-year rule. Now, I'm going to read verse 39. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. That's exactly what the papacy did. Now look at verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, brothers and sisters, we've laid a foundation. Now, I'm going to bring this, this particular uh, DVD to a close on this verse. And I want to reiterate now what we've studied. We've studied, we started with Daniel 2. We laid a foundation that Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, paper Rome. Daniel, the 11th chapter, goes through those same. Daniel 7 went through the same thing. Daniel 8 went through the same thing, adding more information. Daniel 11 goes through the same thing and has laid it out. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and paper Rome. Daniel 11.31 to Daniel 11.39 is dealing with paper Rome. Now, verse 40 says, and at the time of the end, and this day here, time of the end, is 1798. In our next DVD, we'll, we'll get into this. At the time of the end, 1798, shall the king of the south push at him, and the him here is the king of the north, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now, who is this king of the south that suddenly pops back on the scene in 1798 and attacks the king of the north? Let's go to to our screen. First of all, we want to look at just the bust of uh, Augustus Caesar, Mark Anthony, Cleopatra. We will move on past that. That's Tiberius Caesar. Let's move on past this. That's verses 31 that we just talked about. Let's move on past this chart. We've had it up there before. And let's move to this point right here. At this point, we must remember that literally Egypt, the original geographical king of the south, has ceased to be a player in world politics and has not been mentioned by the angel of prophecy since it was subjected to Roman rule by Augustus Caesar in 31 B.C., some 1828 years before. We must also remember that we have seen the power of the king of the north change hands from Seleucus I of the Syrian Empire onto pagan Rome and finally to paper Rome. It is paper Rome that represents the king of the north at the time of the end in 1798. But who or what is this new king of the south? that suddenly appears back on the scene and attacks the king of the north, thus administering the prophetic deadly wound, Revelation 13, 3. It will be shown that this new king of the south is none other than the sixth head of the seven-headed beast of Revelation, the 17th chapter. Let's look at this. This is our final slide. Here we see a picture of the... Berthier coming into Rome to take the Pope captive. The Bible says here that we just read in Daniel 11:40, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Is the king, we know that this event took place in France. Is the king of the south France? I said no. We know that it was Berthier that was sent down to take him captive. Is the king of the south Berthier? Brothers and sisters, I again would say no. Let's continue. We know that the papacy is the king of the north at this time. He receives a deadly wound in 1798. What caused the deadly wound was a separation of church and state. Now remember, let me remind you. Remember in Daniel the 8th chapter, verses 24, it says his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Remember in Daniel 11, 31, it says an arm shall stand by his side. The papacy never had power of his own. It was a union of church and state that gave him his power. 
So all the Bible says that his power would come from the civil authority. So in 1798, it was a separation of church and state, and therefore the Bible says it received a deadly wound because there was a separation of church and state. And let me put in a point here. Therefore, if it was a separation of church and state that caused the deadly wound, the deadly wound cannot be healed until there be a reuniting of church and state. Now, please remember that. The deadly wound cannot be healed until there is a reuniting of church and state because what caused the deadly wound was a separation of church and state. Let's can move forward just one more. Look what the prophet says now. Look what the prophet says. Let me back it up here. In many of the nations of Europe, the powers that rule in church and state had for centuries been controlled by Satan through the medium of the papacy. But here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. It had been Rome's policy under a profession of reverence for the Bible to keep it locked up in an unknown tongue and hidden away from the people under her rule, the witnesses prophesied clothed in sackcloth. But another power, the beast from the bottomless pit, was to arise to make open a vowed war upon the word of God. Did you get that, brothers and sisters? Here the prophet tells us that Satan had ruled the world through the papacy for the last, for the past 1260 years before this. But she says, here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. Now look what she says with the purpose. But another power, the beast from the bottomless pit, was to arise to make open a vowed war upon the word of God. There's so much in that statement that, of course, we don't have time to deal with in this particular DVD. But just hold on. We're going to cover this and a whole lot more. Brothers and sisters, study the information that we've shared with you today. And then let's move on to the next DVD in this series as we continue to look at these prophecies. Prophecies, brothers and sisters, that we need to understand that's going to, each one is looped together and it's going to bring us all the way down here to the end of time and we won't have to guess at anything. We can know exactly what's going on. There's so much going on, brothers and sisters, but we need to know what's going on and we need to know not some man's opinion, not my opinion, not anybody's opinion, but what the Bible and history teaches us. And I promise you, saints, by the grace of God, our eyes are going to be open. Jesus came to give the recovering of sight to the blind. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for your word. Thank you so very much for the prophecies. Your word says the secret things belong unto thee, but those things that you reveal belong unto us. And Lord, all that you have revealed to us, we want to know. You said my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lord, we are seeking knowledge. We are seeking understanding. And we ask you to help us to, to understand. I ask, Lord, thy blessing upon those that have viewed this information thus far. Take them deeper into your study. Help them to understand as well as myself. And help us, Lord, to get Christ in our life. We need a vital connection with thee like we've never needed before. Lord, we're almost, time is almost finished. It's almost over. Soon and very soon, we believe, based on your word, that truly the last act in the drama will take place. And soon, Jesus will come. Lord, we want to be ready. Help us to be ready. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.